We left off at verse 4, so I'll just finish that off quickly because I did comment on that. Now remember, Satan said, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So he plainly lied. He now says that you will not die. And I've shown you the steps where at verse 1, it's a question mark. And then at verse 4, it's now an affirmative statement. But notice how quickly he covered up his lie. If he just ended off at verse 4 that you're not going to die without a reasonable, tempting, true explanation, then you won't believe in his lie. It's like a huge lie, for example, that uh, we can't meet together as a church because it's just not good for society and etc. Now, medical reasons, secular reasons, and scientific reasons, that's a totally different explanation. I'm talking about spiritually here. So I'm talking about the spiritual context, about the great lie that it's not beneficial for society. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting that PhD doctors and standard public sources are publishing about the importance of religion, actually, during the pandemic situation. And that even though for scientific medical reasons they shut down, spiritually it's really taking a toll on the country and it's not really worth it. So then they talked about some measures that the government can do to make it better for the people, which is very interesting. So what I'm basically saying is this, is that you'll always get some sort of scientific, you'll get some sort of reasonable, you'll get some sort of logical explanation for the lie, and it will be true. Did you hear what I just said? It will be true, but the conclusion is a blatant lie. Look at verse 5. Nothing is a lie at verse 5. Absolutely nothing. For God doth know, so God does really know. God knew something. Then the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. So at the very day that they eat the fruit, then what happens is they're going to be open. Their eyes will be open, illuminated. So that's where the professors and the teachers talk about that God was being an oppressive God. He didn't want to give them a greater illumination. But that kind of illumination is where you get into dark stuff with the Masons, where they want to seek uh, illumination, the Rosicrucians, Theosophist societies, New Age occultic societies. It's that dark stuff that Satan wants to accomplish, and higher education is paving the way for that, to greater illumination. If you recall why the Lord already knew, and he doesn't want them to be open to it is because of man's innocent stage, as I've already explained. So I'm not going to expound on that one. It was covered in previous studies. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. True, because Adam and Eve are going to be like the fallen angels, like those little gods, where they have a knowledge of what is wrong and what is right, good and evil. Back then they didn't have that. They were at the stage of innocence. So we're going to see several cases here of Romans chapter 7. So first of all, we're going to look at Romans chapter 7. So it is an important doctrine to understand about the stage of innocence. So back here at the Garden of Eden, the Lord knew that Adam and Eve, they were at the stage of innocence. So they had no knowledge of right and wrong. If there is no knowledge of what is right and wrong, can't really judge that person guilty. It's like, for an example, that even in court, they show leniency towards a person who may be mentally incapable or a person who is not capable of understanding what is right and wrong in the action they committed. The Lord he did this not because he's a mean God, because it's to lay off the responsibility from our shoulders. It's to give us incredible grace and mercy where we can get away with a lot of things. So that is important to understand. So at this stage of innocence, it is important to understand that they have no knowledge like babies, like little children. That's the reason why babies can get away with a lot of things. Because at that point where the baby is crying, his eyes off and then just disturbing mom and dad, it doesn't care about that. Why? It has no idea. It has no comprehension. So 
poor mothers, they feel like they're slave laboring and fathers too, but that's how babies are. Why? Because they don't have a comprehension. So mothers and fathers can't really blame the child for waking them up in the middle of the night or for crying or for not shutting up and for always uh, seeking attention. And you're like, give me a break, give me a moment. Sorry, the child does not comprehend that. So the baby is free. The baby is free from the responsibilities, the problems and uh, the issues to take responsibility for himself or herself. So God has given a pure paradise, see that? No responsibility. The only responsibility was basically don't touch the fruit and to take care of the garden. But, you know, taking care of the garden is a piece of cake, right? Because everything's at the stage of perfection anyways. So he just basically has to live there. If we look at Romans chapter 7, we can see at verse 8, but sin, now notice how sin takes occasion, it takes advantage advantage taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence for without the law sin was dead so notice sin was dead that time sin did not exist it did not give birth because there was no knowledge here of what is right and wrong for i was alive without the law once so notice here that they were alive without the knowledge of right and wrong. That's why God said that they will die, and they truly did die. The reason why they passed from life here at the Garden of Eden, which is from the stage of innocence, into death is because, notice, the whole context is about knowing what is right and wrong. That's the idea of living and dying. The only people who don't know that is PhD idiotic professors who still shoot off of their mouths and they're practically lying or dishonest or they don't know what they're talking about despite of how many PhDs they have. So in totality, the summary is they're incredibly stupid. So it's either those three and you don't change the conclusion they're incredibly stupid. I don't know why you would have them as your professor and learn and pay thousands of dollars to them. But don't make me rant on about that. So the point is here is that God knew and Every baby Christian should know this basically from the scriptures that the reason why they're considered to be alive is they don't have knowledge of right and wrong. So then they don't have accountability. So they don't receive the punishment of death or the deadly consequences. So they live free. That's the idea. But now that they have the knowledge, right, Romans chapter 7, they die. That's why God said ye, ye will die. The next part of verse 9, but when the commandment came, sin revived. See that? So once they knew what was right and wrong, sin revived. It became alive. And what? I died. I was the one who died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death for sin, taking occasion by the commandment. Now look at this. Deceived me. What did the serpent do to fall, to make mankind fall into temptation and to sin? It's through deception. So he deceived them. How did he deceive them? He deceived them by making them fall into sin. And sin is deceptive. So Romans 7 is pretty much going hand in hand with Genesis 3. It is literally hand in hand with Genesis 3. Notice, and by it slew me. So we all died. So Romans 7 is a great case of Genesis 3. So, in other words then, if there are people today who do not have knowledge of right and wrong, such as those with mental conditions and those who are little uh, underage babies, the Lord considers them saved and go to heaven. Yes. Now, the thing is, is that Augustine, even though he's praised by some PhD, it's always PhD people who are idiotic. PhD Christian scholars like R.C. Sproul and the others who, Augustine's a great doctor, he championed philosophy uh, compared to the secular philosophers and etc. Augustine was stupid enough to think about elect babies, so in other words, babies were damned to hell for all eternity if they weren't uh, considered to be saved. Now, I could be misinterpreting that, to, so I'll give the benefit of the doubt, because Calvinists, they always accuse you of misinterpretation, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But the point is over here, is that babies and people are at the stage of innocent, and there are some Calvinists, there is no doubt about that, some Calvinists who have promoted and taught a doctrine about elect babies. 
So babies can be damned for hell for all eternity, which is blatantly wrong. So Romans 7 is a great passage that you want to use that basically people who have no knowledge of right and wrong, they're considered innocent. So then they're saved. They're going to heaven. So I hope that gives some assurance to people. Returning to Genesis chapter 3, we expound verse 5 again. It says, the last part, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the serpent said, you're going to become like the fallen angels, like those little gods, where you know good and evil, what is right and wrong. Now that's important to understand. In other words then, the fallen angels, if we were to think about that, were these fallen angels, so to speak, have an idea of right and wrong? Yeah, they have an idea of right and wrong. There's no doubt about that. If we were to look at Genesis chapter 3, then here's another question. The other question that brings up is, I wonder if they were like Adam and Eve, where they were at the stage of innocent before their fallen stage. Well, the thing is, is that if you look at Genesis chapter 3, it doesn't show that case. It actually shows the opposite. That basically, if you are a fallen angel or those little gods, then you would have knowledge of right and wrong. Think about it. Those angels, when they fell, and Lucifer, who fell, who is one of the angelic beings, and he's a cherub, why did he fall down? Well, he knew. He had all the temptations in his heart at Isaiah chapter 14, right? It was pride. He thought that he could beat God. So he was not deceived. He knew. So he had knowledge of what was right and wrong. The angels knew what they were doing was wrong, but they did it to rebel against God. That's why it's known as the rebellion when the fallen angels followed Satan. Why? Because they directly, they directly violate God's command. They directly violate God's command through knowledge. They know what is right and wrong. They rebel against that. See that? So they had a knowledge of what was right and wrong. That's why they had a heavier penalty compared to mankind. That's the reason why God made mankind in knowledge lower than the angels. That's why God made them innocent. Why? Well, God wanted them to be blind. No, stupid. It's because God knew what had happened to the fallen angels. So then the Lord did that out of mercy for mankind. Mankind is so ungrateful and wicked to blame God and say, well, God just wanted to uh, blind them from the truth and God didn't want them to know what was right and wrong. I mean, mankind can be so evil, so wicked that you got to realize this. If you died and burned in hell, you greatly deserved it because God did everything that he could out of his mercy and grace and put up with your foolish garbage out of your mouth for thousands of years. Yep. Now, we're going to return. We're going to turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Notice that the giving of the law, which instructs about what is right and wrong, is dispensed, carried out by angels. So then these angels, they might have a connection to understanding what is right and wrong. Let's look at Acts chapter 7. Notice what the Bible reads at verse 53. Verse 53. The angels know about the instructions of God's creeds and commandments. Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So notice here that the angels, they have direct instructions to God. They carried it out. We're going to look at the book of 1 Peter. We're going to look at the book of 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, verse 12. Notice that mankind was hidden the knowledge, but the author, Peter, he writes about it's something that even the angels didn't know about. Why did he word it that way? It's taken for granted, see, that angels have greater knowledge of God, of God's doings than mankind. That's why the serpent tempted Adam and Eve. You can know like we do. Those gods who 
have a direct knowledge, a better knowledge of God's workings and doings. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, that's mankind, but unto us, the New Testament Christians, praise the Lord, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Look at this, which things the angels desire to look into. So notice here that it's something that even the angels don't know. Why would Paul word it that way? It's as if it's taken for granted the angels should have more knowledge about God than we do. Now notice that God has given mankind more knowledge, in this case, New Testament salvation. 1 Peter 1.12. The knowledge of New Testament salvation, New Testament doctrine that the angels didn't even know about. So God gave us something that not even the gods know about. No wonder Satan really hates you. You know why? So that's a lie, basically. But he told the truth. So that's how Satan is clever. He'll tell you something that's true, but there's a lie behind it. So the truth is, if you eat the fruit, then you're going to know like we do about God's workings, which is true. That's why you can't deny the Masons, the Theosophist societies, the Rosicrucians. They tell you something that is true about God. They will because they're a little bit closer to the truth of God, but they're not all the way to the truth. Christians have the full knowledge of the truth, and that happens when you go through God's terms and God's ways. But always it takes patience, it takes God's timetable, and it's through a strong relationship with God. Adam and Eve, it wasn't their time yet. It wasn't their time yet. So they want it in now. Christians, we want things now. That's uh, instant gratification of the flesh. But God, he times things rightly, and he'll give you a knowledge greater than not even the devil knows about. But if you follow God's terms, Adam and Eve didn't follow God's terms. That's why they lost it. And you know how long they lost that knowledge of New Testament salvation? 4,000 years. 4,000 years they weren't given that. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Imagine if Adam and Eve waited a little longer if they resisted temptation and sin, then perhaps, so I'm not saying this with full certainty, but perhaps they would have been at the mature age, so to speak, to partake in the fruit and maybe in the knowledge of good and evil when it's God's timetable. Because remember I talked to you about the theory that the fruit was immature that time, indicating that they may have been able to take it later on. Now, don't quote me on that as teaching something wrong and heretical because, me, I don't know 100% certain. However, I believe in exploring the abstract areas because if you always keep avoiding and being scared and even reject the abstract areas, then how can you get closer to the deep doctrine of truth that the Lord's trying to show to you? So I believe in exploring that. I don't get afraid about dodging it, even if it's controversial. I only dodge it as much as I can if it doesn't if it divides or if it hurts the body of Christ. So at those points, I do deviate because it's not the right timetable for the people. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. And then we're going to look at verse 6. Three keys of temptation that I want you to catch, which a lot of Christians talk about. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so notice that she sees that the tree is pleasant to eat. So there's your lust of the flesh. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. It's pleasing to the sight. So there's the lust of the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. So this tree I desire to have. Why? Because it makes me smarter. The pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. So that's why she took the fruit from off the tree and ate it. So compare that with 1 John. Keep your hand at Genesis 3. Go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. The goal of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is to make sure you understand every single word that you're hearing from the Bible. So that's the goal of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. The reason why you'll hear people turning the pages in their Bibles is because they want to look and study the Scriptures you can't just believe a word that I'm saying. You have to look at the Bible. You have to look at the Bible and make sure that what you're hearing is either right or wrong if it matches up and lines up with Scripture. 1 John chapter 2. Notice in verse 16. For all that is in the world, 
So notice the three keys of temptation in the world, the lust of the flesh, there you go, tree good for food to eat, and the lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes, and the pride of life, a tree to be desired to make one wise. Verse 17, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof. So all of this is a starting point of lust. So Eve was not attributed sin until she acted upon the lust. When you ponder and act upon the lust, that's when you get attributed with sin. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Sometimes people feel guilty and they wonder, well, sometimes a flash, uh, a dirty image will flash in my mind or a dream will just pop out in my head that I never thought of before. I mean, I can tell you of other stories of, I mean, even spiritual men of God who lead churches uh, mentioning stuff like, you know, killing themselves, killing people around them, and they're like, this don't even, this not even in my heart, it just pops out of nowhere. So people feel overtly guilty, see that? And they wonder what's wrong with themselves. But here's something you have to understand. What you have to understand is that God will not attribute you with sin at those cases. Why? Because the reason why is when the tempter seeps something inside your head, and then we live in a day and age of the world where it's wicked and evil, you can't help it. The environment, and that's something that even secular psychologists will understand, that the environment, it contributes something to the mind. So you have to understand and don't feel guilty about that sense. The guilt is when you ponder upon it. When that thing pops out, what I would do if I were you is cover it under the blood and pray to the Lord and surrender it. But once you hold that image, see, you made a decision. You made a decision, let me see it a little longer. Let me think about it a little longer. And then you act upon it outwardly. So there's a filthiness within and without that you have to take guard in. But when something comes out within, it's not considered sin until you made a decision to hold upon it. So look at James chapter 1. We'll look at verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So notice temptation starts out that way. But God did not attribute Eve with sin at Genesis 3. So God did not publicly or officially attribute Eve with sin at that point because, look at verse 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. That's the key. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So what God spoke was true. If you eat the fruit, you will die. Why? Because at that action, they chose to sin. When lust conceives itself, when it gets... When it gets born, it brings forth sin. So when you're at that point, which I hope you understand, when you're at that point, that way people don't feel guilty, lust conceives. And that's something that, look, it cannot be changed. It's something that we're all born with. So just because a sodomite might whine that I'm born this way, I can't help it. No, look, all of us sin. Homosexuality is just one of the sins that's in the list. You're not a special exception. Otherwise, I'm a special exception, and so is everybody, about whatever sin they're going through. We're all born with sin, and that line, that line of reasoning is not going to work about your lifestyle because we all have this within us. However, within this spectrum, you have a choice. That's why we argue choice. And the choice is you stop it right here. And this is called your free will. You have a free will to stop it or you have a free will to make a decision to get rid of the line. So the point is, are you putting the line? At that point when lust came out, did you put a line on it? If you don't put a line and made a decision, let's stick to it, then that's where you sinned. And here is where you get the sin at. It comes to two points here, which I hope that you'll understand. Yeah. Uh, let's put the drawing over here. So it comes into two points here. Go to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. 
Again, I told you, don't feel guilty if it comes out inwardly. But guess what? That doesn't mean that you can get away scot-free and sin whatever you want inwardly. The point is, is when lust, not sin yet, lust comes out inwardly, did you make a decision to hold it at that point? Then at that point, you're counted, you're attributed as sin inwardly. Usually what things lead inwardly then will lead outwardly, right? You can't hide it forever. Why? Because, as Jesus mentioned, that out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts. So everything comes from within, defileth the man. But let's look at a few passages here. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's why you have to keep yourself pure. Outward to inward. Inward to outward. The Bible reads at verse 1, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Why? Because of lust within us. So you have to keep cleaning inside. From all filthiness of the, look at this, the filthiness of the flesh and what? Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So it's within and without that you have to keep yourself clean. If you don't do that, then you're going to keep yourself dirty. There's a passage at Proverbs, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, or a passage in the Bible that talks about that. If you look at Matthew 15, uh, turn over there, Matthew 15, Matthew chapter 15, and we're not going to look up this other passage, but the other passage is going to be at Proverbs, and I think what I'll do is I'll just simply uh, quote that one. We're going to look at... Matthew chapter 15, and I think also at the book of Proverbs, I don't really know uh, what chapter and verse anyway. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 15. The Bible says at verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth, see something you do outwardly here, correct? It comes out outwardly because of what you are inwardly come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. So we have to understand that these are the things that defile a man. Things that come out outwardly is because of what you had inwardly. So you have to guard yourself. You have to guard your heart. Uh, you can uh, write down the phrase. I don't know the passage, but the basically... The verse reads, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, okay, thank you. Proverbs chapter 23, uh, verse 7. Oh, yep. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. So I'll read it, and you just write it down if you don't have time to turn there. Proverbs 23, 7. For as, a, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. So sometimes we have to understand that what, you, what comes out from your thought life, it's because of who you are, your heart. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. So I hope that this is very helpful on dealing with temptation and sin. There's another passage. Uh, if I turn to all these passages, we won't have time. But in the book of Matthew, we see the three temptations of Christ. And there are Christians who say that these match with the three types of temptations at 1 John chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. So what started out with the first Adam was also given to the last Adam, so to speak, with those three temptations. The lust of the flesh is the first temptation where Jesus was tempted to turn the stones into bread for good for food, right? Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes in Christ's second temptation with sh being shown all the kingdoms of the world that he sees. And then the pride of life where Satan says, if you are the Son of God, then show off to everybody that you are with the angels catching you. Yeah. Pride of life. So that's where Christians supposedly say it would match up. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. The last part is important. This is a great important passage about what Adam did. So you have to read the scriptures. By reading through the scriptures, and you can draw logical inferences and logical conclusions. 
And a person who's very familiar with the passage and wording of Scripture will come up with the same conclusion. Notice that Eve took the fruit and did eat. Now look at the latter part of verse 6. And gave also unto her husband with her. Now look at that. Notice that when she took the fruit to eat, she gave it to her husband so that her husband can join her. The last part it says, and he did eat. Notice that he ate. That was his reaction and response. When Eve handed the fruit to Adam, then he ate. Notice here that the same case is given, the, or not a similar case, excuse me, not a similar, not the same case is given with Eve at verses 1 through 6. 1 through 6, Eve is deceived. Eve is led astray. So certain, the serpent didn't just hand her the fruit and she ate. No, the serpent tempted her. Eve grabbed the fruit herself and ate it. So Adam, we see here, it was not that case. We don't see that case. It's literally, if you take the word as it says, she gave the fruit to Adam, Adam took it and ate it. There's no deception involved then. This is really given if you look at verse 12. Verse 12, notice Adam's excuse. He didn't say that the serpent tricked me or I was tricked. He said, at verse 12, the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Notice he said, the woman gave me the fruit and I ate. That's different from Eve's excuse at verse 13. Uh, the woman said, the last part of verse 13, the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. See, the woman is saying, I got tricked. Now that would sound like a better excuse. I was tricked. I didn't really know. Why didn't Adam say that? Verse 12, he was giving a different excuse. Look at the wording here. At verse 12, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. Why did he word it that way? Because if you remember Genesis 2, Adam was alone. And God knew that Adam needed a help me. So that's why God blessed Adam with a wife. And then Adam had an affection with his life. He he loved Eve. Him and Eve truly became one. So it's something at the heart of Adam here that we're looking at, verse 12. It's something at his inner heart. That was his weakness. See, his weakness was a woman. Think about King David, who had a close relationship with God, very close relationship with God. And he, he was known as a man after God's own heart. What caused him to fall astray was a woman. Samson, who had all the filling power of the Holy Spirit in conquering with his own physical mind and strength, his weakness was a woman. Usually women are the weak, weak parts of man. But in women's cases, their weak part is all those temptations given at verse 1 through 6. Why? Because women have a thought. They have thinking and emotions. And Satan appeals to those things. Men, their weakness is that they have a strength and a passion for the Lord, but then once they get involved with the woman, all of a sudden they just water down. Now, is there a lot of truth that you see at Genesis 3, 1 through 6 already? Just so much, so much about human nature that we don't know about. If you look at 1 Timothy 2, notice the wording. Man was not deceived. Woman was deceived. That's important to understand. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Notice what the Bible reads. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible said it very plainly. Woman is, uh, man is not deceived. Woman is deceived. The Bible made it even more plain in that case. 1 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible reads at verse 14, and Adam was not deceived. See, that's very plain. Adam didn't get tricked. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. It was Eve that fell into the transgression and sin because she got tricked. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Now, we're not going to turn to Ephesians 5. There's literally so much scripture that I can point out to you about the fallen nature of mankind. I have a basic discipleship course on just the fallen nature of mankind. 
There's just too much on Genesis 3. Just about studying the... If you want anthropology, anthropology, take Genesis 3. But anthropologists don't like to study that. Anthropologists eventually leads to psychology, where they justify their actions. True anthropology and so-called psychology is founded at Genesis chapter 3. The reason why I say so-called psychology is that a lot of the psychology is not science itself. But anyway, before I start a controversy, going back to Genesis chapter 3, we look at uh, verse 6 where Eve gave the fruit to Adam and he did eat. If you compare with Ephesians 5, it makes so much sense. Ephesians 5 the verse at Ephesians 5 matches directly with Genesis 2, remember. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So that's talking about Ephesians 5, about the Christ and the church, which is the relationship of husband and wife, is directly get gleaning from Genesis 2, Adam and Eve. So in Ephesians 5, Christ gave himself for the church. Uh, the husband gave himself to his wife. Why? Out of love. No wonder it matches perfectly with Adam and Eve then. At Genesis 2, Adam loved his wife, lay down his life for her. Love is one of the greatest things that causes a person to give up his or her own benefit. That's why Adam did that and Satan saw that. No wonder God says you have to hate he worded it, hate, father, mother, sister, brother, your own life also, to love me. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. Why? Because God understands that. God took your fallen nature of sin upon himself. That's the only time God gave the devil a temporary victory or a seeming victory. Satan knows the weakness of God. So what, who's he going to attack? You. He knows what grieves God, what hurts God, is always getting you to sin. Getting you to grieve God. That's his only way of getting back at God. Watch yourselves. You don't want to hurt God. You're the weakness to God's side. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. God didn't have to. Um, omnipotent. Omnipotent. But he's willing. He's willing to yield. Yield himself right here put limitations, and put his own rules out of love. Genesis 3, 7, and the eyes of them both were open. So, obviously, what Satan said was true. It's not a lie. But remember, it's uh, a lie that's cloaked with truth. So their eyes were open. So Adam and Eve, now they knew what was right and wrong. And they knew, see that? Their knowledge was open, matching with Romans 7 that they were naked. So notice that they realized about their nakedness. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they were sewing fig leaves together to make themselves aprons. Why? Because they were naked. And that's the important thing about sin. Once you have knowledge, So once you have knowledge here, which is all about death, destruction, responsibility, accountability of your own actions, if you have knowledge of what's right and wrong, what follows and what happens after that, there is a knowing, a realization, and the conscience bothers you, and that's why you get shame. Now, we're going to look at this passage a little bit later. Shame is definitely exemplified from verse 7 all the way down to verse 13. You notice shame follows all the way there. That's the result of eyes being opened. They know what's right and wrong, so then they make excuses about the sins that they've committed. They cover it up. They covered up their nakedness because they're ashamed. So all of verse 7 all the way down to 13 is a matter of shame resulting from sin. S Sigmund Freud, he mentioned about the first tendency about the flesh or libido is done orally. So that's what he claimed. Why Freud was too slow. The Bible says that 
you realize that the first fleshly tendency where we get all accountability and issues is done at verse 6, the mouth. All done through the mouth, orally. See, God knew. God was way ahead. Freud was too slow. Or maybe Freud had a conscience and he tried to cover up his shame because he smoked too much and then he had to go through so many different surgeries and covers up with his mouth because he smoked just too many cigars. There's your uh, father of psychology, so to speak. Very dependable guy. Look at every dependable founder of today's liberal movements. You can find out that they were very dependable people <laughs> or they had crummy lives. If we were to turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, realizing about their sin nature, they had to attempt to cover it. That's the first thing we see here about man trying to take accountability for their sin in action, is that they cover up themselves. And that's done through fig leaves. But go to the book of Isaiah 64. Isaiah chapter 64. But basically, the best of mankind's effort to cover up their sin is what you can see within practically uh, naked displays at Mardi Gras. That's what they were wearing. That's the best of mankind, is that uh, they're, they're just as sinful as Mardi Gras. That's the best nature of mankind, their best efforts. It's not something that's holy. It's not something that's pure. You're far away from that. You know why? Because you are not as holy as God no matter how hard you try. You'll never reach God's level. Look at verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags. So notice that the best you do as a clothing and cover-up like Adam and Eve is filthy rags. Notice how God words it, because he knew what happened at Genesis 3. He knows man's natures of trying his own best effort. Keep reading, and we all do fade as a what? Leaf. Why would God word it that way? All fade as a leaf. All right, returning back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. See, God knows that at best, you're nothing. It disintegrates. Look at yourself, what you're relying on for your salvation. See, you really think that you can go to heaven your own way through your own efforts? <laughs> Good luck with that one. Yeah. Because uh, not all the luck in the world or history is going to save you from hell through your efforts. Yeah. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not your own. Yeah. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So notice that Adam and Eve, they heard God's voice that was moving. It was walking in the garden at what time? The cool of the day. It wasn't late night. It wasn't early morning. It's at the cool time of the day. So one, basically we can see that at their middle of the day, it's a great day. It's cool. It's paradise. When we talk about our relationship and our walk with God, usually it's very much advised that you do it at early morning, the first thing in your day, or late at night. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because uh, at the beginning of your day, you start out clean, then it helps you shield yourself from the filth out there. If you do it at late at night, it makes you end your day clean, and especially when you sleep, and the devil puts all kinds of crazy stuff in your head, you can keep it pure and clean. Not only that, it's a time of quietness. It's a time of quietness where you don't think about all the hectic things in your schedule. You first start out with setting a time with God. Because if you do it at the middle of the day, all the hustle and bustle is in your mind during your walk and talk with Jesus. So usually the beginning of the day or at the end of the night, that's why it's recommended. Uh, there's a doctrine that I've taught in basic doctrines called quiet time. And that is uh, very much needed. However, you notice that Adam and Eve, they could do it at the middle of the day. This throws a little monkey wrench, wrench at quiet time. You might say, why? The reason why is because the Garden of Eden was already pure paradise. No distractions, no hindrances. So they could spend time with God whatever they want. 
But there's a second meaning here. The second meaning is, in your relationship with God, when you talk with God, and that's what's indicated at verse 8. The indication here, if you look at 7, 8, and verse 10, 7, 8, and 10, Adam and Eve already knew about God's timing when he would be coming to spend time to talk with them. So they had a relationship, a daily relationship with God, and this happened during the middle of the day. So when they heard God's voice or when they talked to God, you'll notice that perhaps the middle of the day should be practiced. Now you might say, I thought that quiet time is recommended for the, the first part of the day and the last part of the day. You're right, but there's also another side to it. Another side to it is perhaps God, he wants that quiet time with you as well as the middle of the day. Perhaps he wants that out of you. You might say, why? Because between the first part of the day to the last part of the day, you can easily forget God. So you just need to remind yourself. What did David do? He said not just early in the morning or late at night. He said at the middle of the day too, at the book of Psalms. King David, he had a communication with God that was three times. Think about Daniel. How many times did he communicate with God? Three times. If you were to transform your communication with God three times a day, and not just set aside a quiet time, but three times a day, perhaps it can be even more life-changing for you. You might say, I don't have time. That's the reason why I start out late at night or the middle of the day. Then whatever time you spend at late at night or the middle of the day, divided by three. It's that simple. You might say, why should I do that? The reason why you should do that is because your brain is very forgetful no matter how smart you think you are. Your brain is so forgetful. So just a little bit at the beginning, a little bit at the middle, and a little bit at night is actually far better, perhaps, than spending three hours at the first part of the day and then you easily forget. So perhaps, I'm not saying that is the case, but perhaps that is the case, because I know human nature and the human mind. It forgets very quickly. Because think about this. If you were to think about a, a, a spiritual hike that goes five days long straight, like summer camp, it don't matter how long that communication is. If you don't have anything in between till next year, you easily forget. Yep. And to be quite honest, it's better that you had spiritual church service every single day than just a summer camp for five days long straight. It's better to have a summer camp practically every day that even if just a little bit. That, that way you can keep yourself clean. Uh, every, uh, practically everybody, or no, I'm not going to say everybody, but a lot of people have been saying, I wish that this can keep going on, the summer camp. It's too short. Why? Because you know that if you had this all the time, not too much sin and busyness in between, but just a spiritual cleanliness all the time, it keeps yourself clean. Now, I hope that you learned a lot just from verse 8 about your spiritual walk and spiritual relationship with God. If we keep reading onwards, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So, out of shame and guilt from their sins, Adam and his wife, they hid themselves. Notice the presence of the Lord. So, their walk and talk with God. God's presence amongst them. They hid, hid away from that amongst the trees of the garden. They were hiding here. Why? Because of shame. Because of guilt. Why sometimes you don't read your Bible and pray? Yeah, it's a lot of times because you're lazy. I'll give you that much. But sometimes it's because you know that you just want to keep up with your sin and there's something you're ashamed about. Perhaps you don't want to get victory over your sin and your flesh. That's why you don't want to read your Bible and pray because you know that's going to keep you clean. Maybe that's the reason why. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, why am I not truly reading my Bible and praying? Sure, a lot of times it's the laziness of the flesh, but sometimes it may be because of a sinful nature within you. You know you're going to sin if you don't read the Bible and pray, so why don't you read the Bible and pray? Amen. Perhaps you really don't care about getting victory against the sin. That'll preach. Verse 8 is a lot, of, a lot of preaching right there. Maybe I should preach that for Sunday. Just verse 8. 
Do you, when's the last time you sensed God's presence, His voice talking to you? At verse 8. When's the last time? When is the last time? Sometimes you have to ask yourself that. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam, so God is calling out Adam, and said unto him, he says, where art thou? So Adam, where are you? So God is obviously not stupid. We know that God is uh, all-knowing. He is omniscient. Why would he call it out? The reason why is because the devil asked Eve a question at verse 1, but the devil's not stupid either. The devil knew the question he's asking, but it's done with the intendency to get a reaction. The devil asked the question at verse 1 to get a reaction and a response from the hearer. God asked the question at verse 9 to get a reaction, a response from the hearer. It's one thing that God already knows about all the sins that you've done, but if he doesn't call you out on it and say, hey, Tom, why did you do that this morning? I mean, Tom's not going to get that reaction of conviction, right? Just now, he just felt uncomfortable. I see him moving like this, you know, so <laughs> he's probably going to walk away from church. Now he folded his arms, you know. See, he's very angry, you know, so, <laughs> so we see over here, now his face is turning red out of shame, you know. No, I, now I'm lying, okay, so nothing like that's going on, all right, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just crucifying Tom. Visitors, not, visitors are not going to come to this church anymore. They're going to go, oh man, they're going to call me out. No, I just call it with people who I know really well. <laughs> But anyways, uh, back to the point at hand. You notice from this example, even though it was too much dramatized here, this example shows the, the conviction, the reaction, even more when the person is called out and a question is given. So the Lord, uh, the Lord asks questions to get conviction out of you, not because he's stupid. Amen. It would be a stupid thing if he didn't uh, convict you. If he followed along the professor's advice saying that God was stupid, I don't know why he asked the question. I wouldn't if I knew everything. Well, you're stupid, professor. I just love calling professors stupid. Okay, going back to verse 10. You might say, why, why do you get on them so hard? Because I hate it where they use an intellectual garb to justify themselves on being right and treating God like he's stupid and dumb. That is utter disgrace. The utter disgrace and gets your pastor angry even more is when you raise your intellect high above God's. When you do that, you're committing great blasphemy. That's as much as the devil, right? That's a demonic thinking. Satan said, I will be exalted above myself above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. See, Satan's trying to put himself at a level that tries to beat God. I don't like that. That's a satanic thinking and using your intellectual, intellectual garb to justify it. That's why I get very hard on lost and saved Christian professors. There are some out there who are good, don't get me wrong, and I thank God for them. I get my doctorate, I get my degrees, I have about five of them from, uh, from the schools and institutes. But these kind of, so having an understanding and an empathy on that, I get that but I also understand the nature and tendency. Because you think you know too much, that you can correct God. All right, let's go back to verse 10. Mm, we'll expound verse 10 next time. I'll have to end it here. So verse 10 through 13, I'll expound it next time. But we're going to carry on where I mentioned before, 7 through 13, where we can get into the psychology, so to speak, of mankind, of how they treat and react concerning about their sin nature. So we're going to see more about the unconscious and conscious workings, or basically, quote-unquote, the so-called psychology in 7 through uh, 13. And also, it, we will come down to where I hit my most viral video on YouTube as well within that teaching. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. On my Father, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, and I want to seek and ask that you'll give us wisdom and awareness and carefulness against temptation of the flesh and sin, and help us not to fall prey into the devil's system. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.